is uh, a little bit outside um, on the fringes of epilepsy and to discuss autism and epilepsy. Both disorders are neurological disorders and they are incredibly impairing. And the, it makes life very difficult for both the patients and the families. Since they're, they can be so difficult, to, uh, so difficult and they can coexist, I thought we'd discuss the overlap of, the, of these two disorders. So here's the overview of what we're going to discuss. What you see in italics is the, the, the latest and breaking news. So as many of you know, uh, there, the, the American um, uh, Psych Psychiatry Association uh, about a week and a half ago came out with a new uh, manual, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Uh, they, this is published once every several years, and this is essentially what is used in terms of helping to define different uh, disorders, whether they're psychiatric or neurodevelopmental. And in many ways, the DSM um, is used by both psychiatrists and neurologists alike in terms of defining autism. So previously, we, we've used the DSM-4, the fourth edition of this manual. And now the DSM-5 has just been published about a week and a half ago. In fact, it's still very difficult to get copies of, of the manual. Um, uh, and so we're, so we're going to discuss both uh, definitions of autism from the old DSM-4 as well as the DSM-5. After that, we will discuss the subtypes of autism, uh, what, what are the different uh, syndromes that fall under the term autism, both, again, from the DSM-4, which is something that we used up to about a few weeks ago, and to the DSM-5. Within that, we're going to discuss a little bit regarding the controversies behind the new uh, classifications, what this may mean practically for patients with autism, and, uh, and what it means likely for the future uh, uh, going forward. Uh, after that, we'll discuss the epidemiology of autism, how common is autism, uh, and then we'll move over to epilepsy. We will define epilepsy, and then we'll define different seizure types, and then we're going to move into the coexistence of both these disorders, both autism as well as epilepsy. From, after defining the different syndromes and the overlap between the two, we're going to look at autism and epilepsy from two different perspectives, from the perspective of the child with autism who develops epilepsy, as well as the child with epilepsy who develops autism. So what is autism? Well, according to only recently ago, uh, it's an impairment with, within three domains, reciprocal social interaction. What that means is that I'm responding to what someone else is saying to me. Uh, that I not only will I communicate f uh, forward, but I will take what someone else says, I will internalize it, and then I will respond. Verbal and nonverbal communication. Specifically, this implies not only the ability to communicate uh, with words, but also to uh, use gestures and to understand other people's gestures. Um, and then finally, restricted and repetitive interest. So restricted and repetitive interest could be anything from a repetitive interest is something such as finger tapping uh, or finger flicking, uh, rocking back and forth. Uh, and a restricted interest could be someone who loves to watch the running water and they'll go to a faucet and, and watch water running or watch a, a spinning fan or a spinning wheel or even playing with uh, different toys in an inappropriate way. And the DSM-5 has, has shifted the, uh, the autism from a def by defining it with an impairment within three domains to an impairment within two domains. So what is left is um, an impairment within social communication and restricted interest and repetitive behaviors. What has been taken out here is that verbal and nonverbal communication deficit is not included. Why is that? Why would you take out verbal and nonverbal communication um, an impairment in one of these uh, two areas from the definition of autism. Well, the idea is that, that verbal and nonverbal communication is inherently linked within uh, social interaction and social communication. And, uh, and so it's hard to tease those apart. It is so hard to tease those apart that sometimes uh, these uh, deficits within verbal and nonverbal communication is counted twice using the old definition. Using the old definition, uh, neurologists as well as psychologists 
a neuropsychologist would, ha would have to count up how many impairments in each category. And because the, there's so much overlap between verbal communication and social communication, it becomes difficult to do. So in order to simplify things, we had moved over from three domains to two domains. And again, those two domains is, a, is an impairment in social communication, as well as restricted interest and repetitive behavior. According to DSM-4, there are four subtypes of autism. Childhood autism, Asperger syndrome, PDD-NOS, pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, rest disorder, and childhood disintegrated disorder. As we go through these subtypes of autism, you'll see that the, the final two, rep disorder and childhood disintegrated disorder, don't really belong in this category. In fact, they were um, given separate designation in the DSM-5. So childhood autism. Childhood autism is very similar to how we defined autism spectrum, autistic spectrum disorders. There are deficits involving social skills, uh, communicative language, and imagination. And the communicative language imagination, essentially, these patients have a concrete way of thinking about things and understanding things, as well as a narrowness of focus. Again, that's the rigidity that we discussed, only wanting to do certain things all the time. So for example, children who um, do not want to wear the color green, or children who do not want to eat food that has the color brown. Preoccupations with certain things. Repetitive movements, again, this is a rocking back and forth, the finger fl uh, flicking or the hand flapping, as well as a narrowness or a paucity in speech. So these children uh, typically will repeat the same things over and over again, or they will mimic or mirror someone else's language, but they don't really have much of their own spontaneous speech. Asperger syndrome is defined, uh, has been defined as an IQ greater than 70 where language development is actually not delayed, and the social impairments are less severe. These patients are uh, able to communicate, but they still have difficulty with uh, socializing. Um, and it used to be thought that these patients were a high-functioning version of, um, of, of, of patients with autism. And again, this has uh, come into dispute on, based on several studies, which we'll discuss momentarily. PDD-NOS, that's Pervasive Developmental Disorder, not otherwise specified. This particular category actually lacks an operational definition, and it, may, it makes it very problematic to classify and study. And for, and for this reason, as well as a few others, uh, PDD-NOS was taken out as, uh, as becoming a, a separate subtype within the autistic spectrum disorders, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, Again, because the, because the classification or this category itself is relatively amorphous, it makes it difficult to understand and um, to classify this particular disorder, as well as to study it in terms of prognosis or different therapies or treatments. Childhood disintegrated disorder. Um, these children become symptomatic after the age of three. That's very different than children with autism. Children with autism, the symptoms present before the age of three, throughout the autistic spectrum disorders. However, in childhood disintegrated disorder, the symptoms start after the age of three. So that's pretty unique. In addition to that, not only is there a language regression, which we know children with autism can have a language regression, right? They, these children with, with children with autism um, actually lose words. And so do children with the, with the childhood disintegrated disorder. But in addition to that, they also have a cognitive regression, a motor regression, and a loss of bowel and bladder use. Well, that's very different than uh, children with, uh, with how we understand it, sort of the most children with autism or the autistic spectrum disorders. In fact, uh, this syndrome is quite rare. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and for all of these reasons, uh, and because it really doesn't fit in with how we understand autistic spectrum disorders, it has been removed from as one of the subtypes of autism. In addition to childhood disintegrated disorder being taken out of the new DSM-5 classification, rest disorder has been given its own classification and does not fall under the umbrella of 
uh, autism, autistic spectrum disorders. So with Rett disorder, again, this is quite unique. You have children, girls, who have a normal development for the first six to 18 months. And then after that first half a year to one and a half years, these, these uh, girls develop uh, a partial or complete loss of use of their hands. Uh, rather, they develop this sort of hand-wringing uh, movement, a very stereotypic movement, um, and they're not able to use their hands with the same, uh, uh, they don't have the same function with their hands as they did previously. In addition, there's also a partial or complete loss of spoken language. Beyond that, there is a gait abnormalities as well as a head growth deceleration. A head growth deceleration specifically means that the child is born with a normal head circumference, head size is normal at birth, but as the child gets older, it does not increase at the appropriate rate. So this particular disorder has a known genetic mutation. So yes, the children with Rett disorder um, do have a partial complete loss of spoken language. Um, they can have a relatively normal development up until a particular age, but they develop other symptoms including this loss of uh, acquired purposeful hand skill, the stereotypic hand movements, the head growth deceleration, and even the gait abnormalities, abnormalities in their ability to walk, that really puts it in a very different uh, category and probably does not, um, and while children with breast disorder can have autistic features, that doesn't mean that children, um, that, 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 that breast disorder belongs under the umbrella of autism. This is a picture of a, of a girl who uh, has Rett syndrome, and she ha and here you see her wringing her hands. So the new classification essentially takes syndromes such as aut childhood autism or autistic disorder, childhood in, um, into uh, childhood in, uh, disintegrative disorder, uh, PDD, NOS, and Asperger syndrome, and it does away with them. And instead, you have this other category of autism spectrum disorders. Patients with Asperger syndrome now fall under this rubric of autism spectrum disorder. They don't have um, they don't have their own special uh, title um, in the DSM-5 as they did in the DSM-4. That doesn't mean that a physician can no longer use that term, uh, and that doesn't mean that the diagnosis of Asperger syndrome is now all of a sudden invalid. Physicians can use the term Asperger syndrome. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. But now, Asperger syndrome is really thought to be more just within a spectrum of autism as opposed to its own separate subtype compared to others. And the reason is that there is no research uh, evidence actually demonstrating a statistical difference between Asperger syndrome and other patients with autism. Uh, and that, and as this is very new and this is very controversial, this is still up for debate. Um, and there are definitely uh, families and physicians alike who fall on um, opposite ends of this, uh, of this argument. PDD-NOS, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, is also, um, is also now enveloped by the autism spectrum disorder uh, classification. It's not really supposed to be used anymore. Um, and again, why is that? So we said before that PDD-NOS has this amorphous definition. It doesn't really um, fit. In fact, it overlaps with other subtypes of autism. Um, so to make it, so to make autism in general easier to understand, to classify, uh, this particular um, designation has been removed. And also, the P in PDD NLS is pervasive. And to be clear, it's not really pervasive. Uh, pervasive developmental disorder implies that that there are impairments in almost every uh, uh, area of a child's function. Rather, there's really only two domains that where there's deficits. As we said before, those deficits are in uh, social communication as well as restrictive interests and repetitive behaviors. Uh, finally, the term autistic disorder uh, is also going to be now uh, called autism spectrum disorder. This is very new. Every, all of this is from two weeks ago or so, two and a half weeks ago. However, this has been studied quite extensively. There was a committee run by um, a physician over in the NIH, um, and, there were different, and there were different advocacy groups that were brought to the table to discuss the new types of this new classification. And, uh, and then 
taking this uh, new classification, it was tested in the field where the uh, using these domains, uh, these new domains and these new terms, that it would it still fit with our understanding of autism? And this was all done prior to uh, the release of the DSM-5. Um, and again, just to reiterate, uh, the, if, if a child has a diagnosis of PDD-NOS, autistic disorder, or Asperger's syndrome, that child uh, still has that diagnosis and still has a diagnosis of having autism spectrum disorder. That child should not, should, should not have a decrease in services um, uh, because of that syndrome. New testing should not have to take place for patients who already pre-existing have this particular diagnosis. So again, what is not part of the autism uh, spectrum disorders? It's a childhood disintegrative disorder and the Rett syndrome. And why Rett syndrome? Well, Rett syndrome and as well as childhood disintegrative disorder do not have the similar symptoms. Again, the symptoms of autism, as we said, are symptoms presenting before the age of three with impairments in socializing and restricted interest and repetitive behavior. Rather, in the childhood disintegrative disorder, the symptoms begin after three, and there are impairments with, uh, with motor function, as well as bowel and bladder use, as well as and cognitive regression. As for Rett syndrome, Rett syndrome has also very different symptoms. It's in, it's in girls with a head growth deceleration and a partial or complete loss of the use of the hands. And it has a known genetic cause. And so you, uh, a, a physician can say that this is a, a child with Rett syndrome who has autistic features. Um, but still, again, Rett syndrome uh, falls into its own category. What else is new in the DSM-5? Um, one other thing that has been added is a social communication disorder. So this is a disability in social communication without the presence of repetitive behavior or restricted interest. So as we said before, that there's now two domains to be uh, classified in patients with autism. Um, to, for patients who strictly have a problem with social communication without any other domains being affected, then they, then, then they would fall likely under this particular category. They would have this particular diagnosis of a social communication disorder. And that is, that is new as of a few weeks ago. We mentioned and we touched upon the idea of regression and language regression in autism. So we said that patients with autism can have a language regression. Now, in fact, 30% of children with autism have a language regression. And that, and that occurs before they, these kids reach the age of two. 30% of, of children will, um, will take, will go from speaking a few words um, to, uh, a loss of, of, to a loss of these words. And this is called an autistic regression. And we're going to go back to that. We'll compare some of the other uh, syndromes where there is a language regression, but presents differently than this. Now, other disorders that have a high association with autistic behaviors include fragile X, which is a very which is a common genetic cause uh, for intellectual impairment, previously known as mental retardation, Angelman syndrome, as well as tuberous sclerosis. Let's move on to the epidemiology of autism. How common is autism in America? Well, what you see here, this is these are different. Um, this is different data points published by the CDC. And what they did is they took patients uh, who were uh, in 2000, 2002, 2004, 2006, and 2008, and they looked at, the, at these children um, at, in different cities across the country, and they tried to get a sense of how common autism is. And unfortunately, what you see here is that autism becomes more and more common as the years go by. In fact, and the last study, which was, uh, which was from 2008, demonstrated that one in 88 children have autism. There is a clear uh, gender difference, and it's more common in, bo in boys. One in 54 boys uh, are uh, meet criteria for being, for being autistic or having autism, as opposed to one in 252 girls. 
All right, this uh, just jumped ahead of me for a second. Uh, so let's pause here at this picture to recap what we've discussed. We went through the old and the new definition of autism. Now the autism is defined in two domains, social communication impairments, as well as restrictive interests and repetitive behaviors. We've gone through the old uh, subtypes of autism. And what we've discussed is that PDD, NOS, Asperger's syndrome, and, and the childhood autism or autistic disorder has now been enveloped in the, uh, this new category, which is um, just termed autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and Rett syndrome and childhood disintegrative disorder have been taken out from that umbrella and given their own separate uh, uh, categorization. Now, now that we've discussed autism, let's discuss epilepsy. Epilepsy is a neurological condition that produces seizures that affect a variety of functions. The definition of epilepsy is having more than one unprovoked seizure. So a child who has one seizure does not have epilepsy, but a child that has more than one seizure does meet that criteria for, criteria for having epilepsy. What is a seizure? There's been many de definitions of uh, seizures. I think that the best definition comes from the Epilepsy Foundation, which states that a seizure is a sudden surge of electrical activity in the, uh, in the brain that affects how a person feels or acts for a short period of time. Essentially, what we have here in the case of a seizure is that there are a network of nerve cells that, that start inappropriately firing. And this inappropriate firing synchronizes and can take over the normal function of the brain. And that can affect how a person feels or acts, and it's involuntary. They don't have control over it. There are three seizure types. Generalized, meaning that both hemispheres, both halves of the brain, have a seizure during the same time. Focal, focal is defined as a seizure occurring only in one part of the brain, but the rest of the brain not having seizure and focal with secondary generalization. That is, the seizure only begins in one part of the brain, the rest of the brain is not having the seizure. However, that seizure actually spreads and it can generalize to affect both halves, both hemispheres of the brain. Under the rubric of generalized seizures, we see four different seizure types. The generalized tonic-clonic seizures, that's what most people think of when they think of seizures. These are also known as grand mal seizures. In this case, the patients are unconscious and they have whole body shaking. Absence seizures are also known as petite mal seizures. This typically consists of staring and being unaware for a brief period of time, seconds is, is as, long as, it need, as long as it takes typically. Myoclonic seizures are light and fast jerks of the arm or leg um, and uh, as opposed to uh, the general tonic clonic seizures, so there's, where it goes back and forth between stiffening and shaking, stiffening and shaking. The myoclonic seizure is a very fast jerk of either the upper or lower extremities. A drop seizure, previously known as a tonic seizure, essentially is a person who falls to the, to the ground quickly. And it, a tonic implies it's a lack of tone, but it doesn't have to be. It could be an excessive tone. Some people feel like they're being pushed to the ground as opposed to losing the tone of their body. And that's called a drop seizure. So all four of these seizure types, generalized tonic, clonic, abscond, myoclonic, and drop seizures are generalized. Again, meaning that the both sides, both halves of the brain have a seizure at the same time. So focal seizures, focal seizures are again seizures that start in one part of the brain and the rest of the brain is not having a seizure. And those have been classically separated by either simple or complex. So a simple focal seizure, also known as a simple partial seizure, is one in which the person remains conscious. They know what's going on, but yet their motor system, meaning their ability to move, their sensory system, meaning their ability to feel, um, or their visual system is affected. So an example there is, uh, is that a person could feel numbness or tingling in one part of their body, and that can be part of their seizure or they can actually see something in the corner of their eye or part of their visual field, uh, and that object that they see can be part of the seizure. So for example, I had a patient once um, that, we, uh, that we had in the hospital uh, who 
whenever his seizure occurred, he'd always see a beach ball in, his, in the left corner of his eye. In the left, and wherever he was looking, the left corner of his vision, he would see a beach ball. And that actually represented part of his seizure. Again, because the visual system here is effective. Now, the other type of focal seizures uh, or partial seizures are known as complex partial seizures. And in that case, patients have an impairment of consciousness. So unlike the simple partial seizures where they're completely aware, in the complex partial seizures, they, might, they may either be completely not aware or uh, somewhat impaired. And this could present as either staring or motor symptoms. Again, the motor symptoms is the shaking and, or staring. Now this is an important point. So staring can either be caused by a generalized seizure, in the example of the absence that we spoke before, here in the second one here, Right, so the absence is, all, is staring, but so can the complex partial be staring. And the only way to really differentiate that, or not the only way, but one of the most helpful ways, is by an EEG. An EEG can help ease apart um, a generalized versus a focal seizure that consists of staring. And that can be helpful in that particular case uh, in order to guide which medication may be the correct one for that patient. Let's move on and talk about the overlap between autism and epilepsy. How common is epilepsy in patients with autism or vice versa? So from different studies, looking at patients in different settings, we see almost the same numbers. So here we see on the first line that 30% of patients with autism have epilepsy. And then you also see that 30% of patients with epilepsy have autism. So if we walk through an epilepsy office, we see that about 30% of the patients have autism. And on the flip side, if we walk through a autism center, we would see that about 30% of those patients have epilepsy. Who is at risk uh, for epilepsy? Which patients with autism are most risk for developing epilepsy? So we see that the highest risk for autism is seen in those whose seizures start within the first year of life. So those with seizures under the age of one, even if it's just one seizure, and it has not been completely defined as epilepsy at this point, because epilepsy needs more than one seizure, we know that this person is someone that we need to watch out for. This person is at risk uh, for developing epilepsy. Now, um, now, in addition to that, we know that patients who have uh, a great uh, intellectual disability, meaning that these are patients with low IQ scores. Patients with low IQ scores or greater intellectual disability are at risk for um, uh, developing epilepsy. And also for patients with autism who are symptomatic, meaning that we know the cause of their autism or their autistic features. Uh, we know that those patients are at higher risk um, for developing epilepsy. In addition, patients with that autistic regression that we spoke about before, the patients who have um, a loss of language before the age of two, these are patients that were also uh, that are also at a higher risk for developing epilepsy. And what you see here in the second line from the bottom is a very interesting and a very important statistic to know. Between 35 to 65 patients with autism have EEG abnormalities. That's interesting when you compare it to the first line on the slide. We see only 30% of patients with autism have epilepsy, but yet a much higher number of patients with autism actually have EEG abnormalities. So what that tells you is that just because a person with autism has an abnormal EEG, meaning that they show signs that, they, uh, that this person is at risk for seizures, does not necessarily confer the diagnosis of epilepsy. It does not mean that this person is going to have seizures uh, and you should start medicating because we see that there's a much higher number of patients with an abnormal EEG than there are patients who actually have epilepsy in the autism world. Now, the last line actually got cut off here. It says that epilepsy and autism confers increased blank. And what that, how that line actually ends on that PowerPoint slide is that epilepsy and autism uh, confers an increased risk of uh, morbidities uh, or uh, mortality, meaning death. And that's just because we know that seizures can cause injury, uh, and seizures can also um, per, put a person at risk for death, just because just as 
you know, the environment where the seizure occurs or uh, also because of the syndrome known as sudden unexpected death in epilepsy patients, stu death. Um, so patients with epilepsy are at a higher risk uh, for injury or death, and so therefore patients with autism uh, who have epilepsy are also thus uh, at an increased risk for epilepsy or death. Uh, sorry, for increased risk for injury or death. Now, diagnosing epilepsy in children with autism can be difficult, and it can be difficult for two reasons. One is that some of the episodes that we are concerned about uh, that look like seizures, we see in patients with autism because they have, patients with autism can have repetitive movements. We discussed that before, that this is one of the domains as a definition of autism, is this repetitive movement or behavior. So it can be difficult to distinguish a, a behavioral episode, whether that's staring or repetitive movement from an epileptic seizure. And in that case, this is where the EEG becomes vital. A video EEG specifically, where you're actually capturing how the patient looks on camera, as well as how the patient's brain looks on EEG in real time, uh, can you can characterize those episodes and say that, yes, these episodes are epileptic, we need to start this patient on an anti-seizure medication. Or we could say that these episodes are not epileptic and we should not expose this patient to uh, this medication because it's not going to help these movements anyway. Um, and it's difficult here because uh, we know that the EEG may be abnormal in patients who do not have epileptic seizures. This is what we just said in the last slide, that there are a higher preponderance of patients with autism who have abnormal EEGs, but that does not mean that they have epilepsy. So you really have to capture the episode. Sometimes it's enough uh, just to do a routine EEG. But other times, if you have an abnormal EEG, um, but you did not capture the episode, you, uh, you really want to try to see if you can get the patient on a video EEG if possible to capture exactly what they're doing as they're doing it on the EEG. And so you can therefore put it to a rest whether or not these episodes are truly epileptic. What's the goal for treating patients um, with autism who have epilepsy? The goal for treating epilepsy in children with autism is the same as the goal for treating epilepsy in any child, and that is to eliminate seizures without negatively impacting behavior or cognition. It's important to make these seizures go away. Again, we discussed before that seizures, seizures uh, confer an increased risk of morbidity and mortality. However, to totally make the seizures go away, to have such a, an impairing side effect that they make the child incredibly sleepy or they make them incredibly irritable, that's not a real good quality of life either. It's, a, it's important that a child has a, a normal life, a normal quality of life, as much as we can give them, um, and make the seizures go away at the same time. And to do one without, and hurt the other really just uh, puts the child at further risk for other health problems and, and again, is incredibly disruptive to both the child and the family. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move on and, discuss, and look at the overlap between autism and epilepsy from two different perspectives. First, we're going to start discussing children with autism who develop epilepsy. So these are kids who have already had the diagnosis of autism, and, and then we start, and we start seeing seizures coming about later in life. To be clear, the core deficits of autism for those core social, for those core impairments that define autism, the therapy of choice is psychosocial therapy. Psychosocial therapy, which is not medication, is not pharmacologic, is engaged, intense, and individualized. And that is what helps a patient with their autistic features. Giving a child medication, and we have plenty of medications to, um, to help with different types of behaviors, is not going to get at the core deficit. You really, uh, these children and these patients, adults or children, need psychosocial therapy. So there are multiple philosophies of psychosocial therapy. One is a relationship-based approach. 
Um, and what that does is that it looks at the underlying developmental process. It takes a child and takes what their, what their skills are, what they're good at already, and tries to use that to build on other skills to help them function in daily life. Uh, a very common, uh, a different philosophy that's very commonly used is ABA therapy, also known, also known as applied behavioral analysis. And what that is is that teaching behavioral, teaching behavior and skills through environmental manipulation. So the instructor, instead of working with the the strengths of the child, will work on the child's weaknesses by manipulating the environment. So, for example, if a child is uh, needs to learn how to ask for things appropriately, that the instructor will put an object out of reach from the child uh, and will only reward the child by giving them the object once they have learned to ask for it in an appropriate manner. Okay, but let's go back to the seizures in kids with autism. What is the right drug to prevent seizures in children with autism? Unfortunately, there have been no randomized controlled trials to test the effects of anticonvulsants in well-defined populations of children with autism and epilepsy. There, there have been small studies and open label studies. And what we know is that in small studies that Depakote, Lamictal, Keppra, ketogenic diet, and vagal nerve simulator have been quite effective. So the ketogenic diet, for those who don't know, is essentially a diet where carbohydrates are eliminated, and that's been found to be very effective um, for uh, for eliminating seizures. There was one study done, I believe, in Athens where they looked at the ketogenic diet for patients with autistic features, and they didn't find enough of a statistical significance to go on further. Um, so essentially what they did is they took kids with autism who did not have seizures, and they just wanted to see, are those patients, are their behaviors going to improve, are those deficits going to improve, and they didn't really find enough of improvement to make a firm recommendation. Um, the vagal nerve simulator uh, is, uh, is essentially, um, you probably have heard about that through other talks, but what a vagal nerve simulator is, is essentially a, a generator that has a wire that loops around a nerve that's in the neck. And that nerve that's in the neck communicates back and forth between the body and the brain. And that stimulator essentially sends an impulse, an electrical impulse, to that wire that it goes up into the brain and it can help suppress seizures. So that's a ketogenic diet, that's a vagal nerve simulator. Those are two non-pharmacologic or non-medication based therapies and small open label trials have been seen to be effective in treating seizures in kids with autism. Again, open label trials, just to be clear, are trials in which uh, everyone knows what therapy they're getting. There's no placebo effect. Um, and there's uh, at all. Now, to be, now the first two medications that are mentioned here, Depakote and Lamictal. Depakote and Lamictal are known to be very good anticonvulsants, anti-seizure medicines, and they're also known to be mood stabilizers. So that can be very helpful in uh, certain patients. Psychiatrists have, have used these medications before for mood stabilization instead of seizures. So these two medications were looked at in patients with autism to see if that would help uh, control some of their behaviors and their moods. And so far, the results have been equivocal. Some studies have shown that there is an improvement. Some, shows that some have shown no improvement. So the jury is still out uh, as to how effective Depakote and Lamictal are um, in terms of treating not only the seizures, but also the behaviors. Let's move on to that final category and talk about children with epilepsy who develop autism. Children uh, who have epilepsy that, de that develop autistic features uh, have typically what's called an epileptic encephalopathy. An epileptic encephalopathy entails a condition in which the EEG abnormalities themselves, not the seizures, but what the, what the brain waves look like in between seizures are believed to contribute to a progressive disturbance in brain function. So typically, 
we would just look at the G, we just look at the sorry, we just look at the seizures and we just treat seizures. And what we're worried about is stopping seizures. But in patients with epileptic encephalopathy, not only are we worried about seizures, that's so important, but here we're trying to control the what the EEG looks like even in between seizures. And different waveform can be so chaotic that it can make it difficult for a person to function and to develop. What we see in patients with uh, an epileptic encephalopathy is that they develop a regression or a slowing of their cognition, language, or behavior strictly due to the interictal activity of the EEG. What that word means, interictal, is that ictal, the, uh, the root of that word, um, refers to seizure, and indirect both in between seizure. So again, the abnormalities in between the seizure affects the cognition, the language, and, um, and behavioral development. <coughs> Excuse me. Different syndromes that have been uh, termed epileptic encephalopathies uh, include West syndrome, without spasms. Some people feel that Dravet syndrome, which is a rare genetic disorder caused by a mutation in the, in the sodium channel. Lennox Gastaut, which is a, a syndrome that many patients with West syndrome can develop, as well as Lando Kleffner, which we'll also talk about momentarily. I'm trying to advance. Okay, there we go. So uh, West syndrome. So West syndrome, also known as infantile spasm. What this is is children uh, between four to eight months of life, so young infants, develop spasms. Spasms is a sudden bending forward of the head with extension uh, of the arms and legs. And they have a very abnormal EEG. This EEG is known as hypsarrhythmia. And even if you've never seen an EEG in your life, you can see that there are very high voltage waves. They are chaotic. There's really no organization. If you flip this page uh, upside down, it was so kind of look the same. Um, so that's known as hypsarrhythmia. Uh, and uh, this triad of spasms, the onset, and the, and the EG uh, of hypsarrhythmia uh, is how you define West syndrome, also known as infantile spasms. And you can break it down further. You can define it further in either symptomatic or idiopathic causes. So symptomatic means we know the cause. Um, and uh, and idiopathic essentially just means that we're not sure what the cause is. And in fact, that distinction is incredibly important, and we'll discuss why in a moment. In patients with West syndrome or infantile spasms, the prevalence of autism can be as high as 35%. So, patient, so there's a little bit more than a third chance that a patient with West syndrome would go on to develop autistic features. What does that depend on? How, do we, how can we get a sense of who's a high, at higher risk? Well, that depends uh, on IQ of the patient uh, as they grow older. What we find is that the patients with the lower IQ, with the greater amount of intellectual disability, are at risk for autistic features. It, could, it also depends if, if the patient is symptomatic or idiopathic. Patients who are symptomatic, we know what the cause is, have a higher risk of developing autistic features as opposed to those who, are, who have an idiopathic uh, West syndrome or, or idiopathic infantile spasm. Finally, if the EEG does not normalize after treatment, the definition of a successful treatment of a patient with infantile spasms is not only do the spasms go away, but the EEG normalizes. So if the EEG does not get normal, if the epileptic encephalopathy continues, this patient is at a higher risk of developing, uh, of developing autism. The cause of the spasms is the most important factor uh, for putting the for in terms of the child being at risk for autism, as well as if the child is at risk for lifelong epilepsy. Now, I get this question a lot, and I wanted just to mention it briefly here. Uh, does early treatment improve developmental outcomes in infantile spasms? Meaning that many people um, don't pick up on the symptoms of, of spasms and, and understand or realize that it's, an, it's actually an epilepsy until um, months down the road. Uh, typically, you know, we're well not typically, but in, in some cases, <coughs> um, spasms can be misdiagnosed as 
as a um, as regurgitation, for example. Um, so the question becomes, well, if we just treated it earlier, would my child have uh, done better? Whether you're referring to cognitively from a seizure frequency perspective uh, or from an autism perspective, and the answer is we don't know. We really don't know. Um, there, there has never been, and I would be very surprised if there ever would be, a study where they take 100 patients with uh, infantile spasms and they delay the treatment for a segment of the population, and then they, or they treat aggressively immediately for the other population. So that, that, that trial has never been done, so it's unclear if treating early actually um, would help improve developmental outcomes. Lambda Klesner syndrome is, um, has some overlap with autistic features, and that's why it's included here. Uh, Lambda Klesner syndrome typically begins in kids who are between three to six years of age, and what they develop is, a, is they either develop a sudden or gradual aphasia. And aphasia is defined as the inability to understand or express language. But it starts typically with a child who loses the ability to understand the language. They do not recognize words that are familiar. Um, so they used to know what, what you meant when you said something, but they develop, um, they start to lose the ability to recognize the, what, the, what these words mean, and this is called a verbal auditory agnosia. Now, this, these, this, this language skill impairment uh, can worsen, and they can also lose the ability to express language. So here you have a patient who loses the ability to understand and express language. Well, again, that's a problem with a social communication, and that can look very similar to other, you know, other forms of autism that we've discussed. But this is different from autism in the sense that it, it starts at a later age in life. Also, the EEG is very different. Typically, the EEG uh, develops or demonstrates a near-continuous epileptiform abnormality. When the patient falls asleep, they have this abnormality known as ESES, -E you see here on the bottom, and that's electrographic status epilepticus of sleep. When the patient falls asleep, they have so many spikes um, populating the EEG that it looks like they're actually having a continuous seizure. That may not necessarily be the, be the case, but we see that there is a link between this developmental regression um, and this electrographic finding of uh, the frequent spikes or the frequent epileptiform abnormalities um, during sleep. How do you treat landau klesner syndrome? Well, landau klesner syndrome um, can be treated in a variety of ways, and different studies show uh, different effectiveness for these uh, therapies, and that includes steroids high-dose benzodiazepines, immunoglobulins, ONSI, which is a benzodiazepine that, is, uh, that, was, uh, that we used to be called frisium in Europe, Keppra, and ketogenic diet have all been associated with improvements in behavior and language function. Sometimes these therapies don't work, and uh, in certain cases, patients are referred to for surgery. Now, the, now what's difficult about surgery is that patients with Lambda Klefner have impairment in their language areas, as we discussed. So typical epilepsy surgery usually involves a resection, removing completely part of the brain that we think is causing, a, is causing a seizure. But we don't want to remove the language sensors of the brain. It's not going to help the patient. In fact, it, will just, it could possibly make them worse. So how do we leave intact the actual um, language sensors with uh, and at the same time interfere with the seizure network. So what is done is called a multiple subpeel transaction. And what that involves is essentially thin uh, slices that are made um, into, uh, into different layers of the brain um, and, uh, in order to uh, break up or interfere with the seizure without actually um, affecting or impairing um, the ability to express or understand language. How do we differentiate between childhood autism and landau klefner Both syndromes have a language regression that we discussed, and that impairment in social communication can evolve, and, um, and we can find impair other impairments, including restricted interests. So how do we differentiate between the two? So we mentioned before, 
that the age of regression is different. The age of, of the autistic regression is under the age of two, unlike Landau-Klesner, which we typically see that between the ages of three and six. The degree and type of regression is also very different. In the autistic regression, we see that the, that the patients lose the ability to express language. However, in Landau-Klesner, um, they first start losing the ability to understand. That's very, that's very different. In addition, the frequency of EEG abnormalities are different. Patients with autism do not have to have EEG abnormalities. Uh, however, patients with Landau-Klesner typically, not always, but typically, uh, had this a very characteristic EEG abnormality of the ESES, the electrographic epilepticus of sleep finding. So when we get into these conversations where we talk about epileptic encephalopathies, such as infantile spasms or Landau-Klefner, and we, and we discuss that the EEG abnormality, not the seizure, just the EEG abnormality itself is the cause um, for these different regressions, the question is posed, well, is autism epileptic encephalopathy? We discussed earlier that, aut that patients with autism, between 35 to 65 percent of patients with autism can have abnormal abnormal EEGs. So if we just get rid of the abnormal EEG, if we just make the abnormal EEG normal, would that make the patient better? And the answer is typically no. That, that yes, it is true that, that patients with autism are the higher risk for having abnormal EEGs. However, that does not imply um, necessarily that patients with autism have an epileptic encephalopathy. There, doesn't, there typically isn't such a high burden of uh, abnormalities on the EEG that we think that this would be a, um, as disruptive um, in terms of a patient's cognition or progression. So again, <clears throat> should any autistic child with an abnormal EEG receive a seizure medication? Again, so the question is, if you make the uh, abnormal EEG better, does that, would that help a child? Um, so to understand that, we first we have to state the obvious, again, that abnormal EEGs do not um, confer the diagnosis of epilepsy. You have to have seizures. Uh, and typically, in most patients who do not have epileptic encephalopathy, we treat the patient. We don't treat the EEG. We, if the patient's having seizures, we give them medication uh, to prevent the seizures. As opposed to epileptic encephalopathies, with epileptic encephalopathies, we treat the EEG, not just the patient. And typically what is understood is that treating EEG abnormalities in patients with autism and in the general population does not improve social communication. So we've covered a lot, actually. Uh, we've started out here by discussing the definition of autism, and we've gone through the subtypes of autism, both through the DSM-4 and the DSM-5 criteria. We moved on and discussed how common is autism in the general population, and unfortunately we're seeing it become more and more common as years go on. Uh, we've also touched upon the definition of epilepsy and defining seizures. We discussed how these two disorders uh, overlap and coexist. And we looked at autism, uh, we looked at autism uh, and epilepsy from two different perspectives, both from the child who, who has autism, who develops epilepsy, as well as the child who, uh, who has epilepsy, who develops autistic features. I want to uh, state here just some final thoughts, and that is that uh, these two disorders are hard. Having just one of these uh, neurological um, problems can be incredibly difficult for everyone. Uh, and to have both of them in combination, which can occur, these can coexist, can be very difficult. And, and not only does aut do autism and epilepsy affect development and cognition, but they can affect other parts of life as well. And, they can, and you can see other medical problems being associated with autism and epilepsy. And so therefore, the neurologist uh, in the setting needs to be part of the child's team. It's not enough that, that the neurologist is sitting in an office somewhere um, telling people what to do, but rather that neurologist needs to have their sleeves rolled up and communicating with other people who take care of the child. Um, that is you know, what we do over in um, over in the Northeast Regional Epilepsy Group, I reach out to the primary care physicians as well as to uh, pulmonologists or cardiologists, other people who are, who are involved in the child's care, um, because our treatments 
uh, can affect other organ systems, and we try to find what is the best intervention for the child to try to try to help them uh, the most without causing any adverse effects. The last line here about no two patients are the same is very true. Many of us, we're all desperate. We're desperate to help uh, our patients, and our families are desperate to help their children, and we all get that. And so many times, uh, people will turn to uh, different support groups looking for advice and help. Uh, and on those support groups, what we frequently see is that um, some people had a fantastic response, or some people had a horrible response to particular medications or interventions. And it's important to keep in mind that not everyone's the same. And different people are going to have success with different therapies, and other people it will not work out as well. And that is why it's so important to keep open lines of communication with your physician. Your physician should be willing to discuss with you different, maybe even alternative therapies that you have discovered by talking to other families um, and discuss the pros and cons. So really, the, both physician and family alike can make uh, one unified, appropriate decision um, for the patient. I want to thank everyone who took the time out of their evening tonight uh, to listen to the talk. Uh, there's so much more that could be said and should be said about this, and uh, devoting one hour is, is definitely not enough. Um, you're uh, welcome to, uh, to contact me directly um, through the email link that will be provided to you uh, to discuss further. Or to, uh, or to have a longer conversation in person in the office. Um, again, this is very difficult. We're all here to help, and, um, and we're available for you. So thank you very much, and, um, and, uh, and I look forward to, uh, uh, to continuing this conversation uh, in the future. Have a good night.